Minister, thanks for your time. Thanks for having me, Lou. Have you modelled the impact these policies announced today will have on Australia's emissions by 2050? Look, we, we've, we have, through the work we've done, as part of prioritising these technologies, ascertained that by 2040 we could reduce emissions by about 250, the equivalent of about 250 million tonnes. That's close to half of Australia's uh, emissions just from success in reaching the stretch goals on these technologies. So, and of course, just to, sorry, just to be clear before you go on, so are you saying that you would have a reduction of 50% what on today's emissions level or what's yeah, your baseline? Yeah, that's correct. That's, that, that's correct. And that's just on these technologies, of course. I mean, there's other things going on uh, which are driving down emissions. So they're a very substantial part of our economy that's being affected by the But we are a signatory to the Paris Agreement, which means mm. by 2050 we're supposed to be at net zero. So if you're only at a 50% reduction by 2040, that only gives you 10 more years to then get to another 50%. Now, I've, I've heard others make this point, uh, Lee, and let, let's be very clear about this. The primary nationally determined contribution, as they're called, in the Paris Agreement is to a 2030 target. Now, we have a very clear 2030 target, a 26% emission reduction on our 2005 baseline levels. And just as we've met and beaten our 2020 targets, we're on target to meet and beat our 2030 goals. Um, now, uh, there, there is not, as you say, a commitment from individual countries in Paris to be net zero by 2050. The commitment is a global commitment to get to net zero in the second half of the century. And that's why technology is so critical. We want to bring that forward to as soon as possible. But ultimately, this is a global commitment and it's going to require global solutions. Countries such as the UK and the EU have set a net zero emissions target by 2050 for themselves. We're talking about the second half of the century. I mean, what are we talking about, about 2051 or 2099? Because that is a very big window. Well, as soon as possible. I mean, we've been very clear on that. But the, the pathway to get there, as the Prime Minister said on the ABC on the weekend, is for these technologies to become economic as soon as possible. And that's what this technology investment plan that we've laid out today is all about. Can I ask about one of the technologies we're going to be relying upon more, which is hydrogen? Mm. It has to be produced, and it can be produced by renewable energy, so-called green hydrogen, mm. or by gas, blue hydrogen, which creates mm. more pollution. What percentage of each is Australia aiming for in its mix? Well, we'd expect the mix to move over time. And we're already a major hydrogen producer. But ha we, have we got uh, targets, though, on that? Well, well hang on, let, let me finish. We're already a major hydrogen producer. We use hydrogen uh, to produce fertiliser and plastics and other, other materials uh, now. Uh, but there is potential over time to migrate uh, towards green hydrogen and to use carbon capture and storage to decarbonise the, the, the process of producing hydrogen and not just using it as an industrial feedstock for products like, like uh, fertiliser, but to use it as a source of energy. And again, uh, I ask, what is we've there a time frame for where, the, where that mix well, is going well, both, to start shifting? Well, both blue and green hydrogen can be decarbonised, is my point. Both of them can be. The Prime Minister's been talking about using gas as a transition technology. Gas emits half, the, half as uh, much carbon dioxide as coal to produce the same amount of power. Why not put all of your efforts into fast-tracking renewables rather than going to gas first so that you can have only one transition point instead of two? Well, they're complementary. This is the point. I mean, the chief scientist, Alan Finkel, has, has said himself that gas is the perfect complement to solar and wind. And the reason is that alongside solar and wind, which, which is e producing energy when the sun shines and the wind blows, you need dispatchable energy sources that can fill the gap. And, and gas can do that. Pump hydro can do that. That's why we're investing in, in Snowy too. Uh, batteries over time can do that. They can do that for short duration economically now. Over time, those durations will get longer. And it's a balance of those dispatchable energy sources we're going to need. Now, gas is a big opportunity for Australia right now. We've seen the price of gas come down very substantially pre-COVID and continue down beyond that. The market uh, signals are that the gas price is going to stay much lower than it was uh, and that creates an opportunity to use gas to complement our record level of investment in renewables. The former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull has been highly crit critical of this announcement today and the Prime Minister's about gas uh, last week. He says in the energy sector people are just punch drunk with these random interventions from government. It's got to stop. We need a coherent energy and climate policy. We had that with the National Energy Guarantee. Well, the National Energy Guarantee had two pieces, Lee. The first is a retailer reliability obligation 
to encourage dispatchability, which is a very good thing. I've always strongly supported it, and we've done that. That went into place uh, late last year, and, and it's in place now, and we'll continue to fine-tune it. Very important reform. The second part of the National Energy Guarantee uh, was a target to reduce emissions by 26% in the national electricity market. We'll get to that for 2030. We'll get to that target uh, either this year or next, nine or ten years ahead of time, Lee. So we've achieved the outcomes there. We've achieved the outcomes there. Now, we do need to see a competitive gas market. We do need to see a balance in our grid. We do need to see Liddell replaced. Uh, and uh, they are all important initiatives that will ensure that we have the, the overall objective we all want here, which is affordable, reliable energy, job creation in energy intensive sectors as we bring down emissions. That's achievable, but we need to work and continue to work closely with industry to achieve it. On another matter, a report by the Auditor General has found the federal government, when purchasing land in Western Sydney for a second airport, pay, paid the owners 10 times what the land was worth. Mm. This comes on top of your own distribution of false information about the Sydney City Council and the sports rorts affair where taxpayer money was channelled to seats the coalition was targeting at the, at the last election. There seems to be a pattern here in government of, at the very least, sloppiness or negligence, doesn't there? Well, I've rejected the allegations you just put in the past, but look, no, I'm just talking I, I about a broader pattern, right. though, look, of things where we never seem to quite get to the bottom of how these things occur. Well, Lee, I've been very clear on your program on a number of occasions on on some of the allegations you're making there, and and I'm not going to go back over that uh, because we've dealt with it in the past. But look, um, you know, the ANAO put out a report. Uh, the department there was a number of recommendations in it. The departments accepted their recommendations, and they're getting on with it. Um, and that's. The role of the ANAO, that's the role of the Auditor General. It's, a, it's an appropriate role. And as I understand it, the, uh, the department has responded, agreed to the recommendations uh, and will address the issues that were raised. Minister, thank you for your time. Thanks, Lee. Hi, I'm Lee Sales. Thanks for watching this story. If you'd like to watch more of 7.30's stories, they are on the left of your screen. And tap on the button below to subscribe and get the latest from ABC News.